live stream is working. Just so you know. Great. Good morning. Um, at this time, uh, we're convening the City Council Ad Hoc Committee on Sustainability and Climate Action Plan. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Brad Eggleston, who uh, will be leading the content of the meeting and, um, and welcome everybody on board. Uh, Brad? Thank you, Mayor Burt. Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to the February meeting of the City Council uh, Sustainability Climate Action Plan Ad Hoc Committee. I'm Brad Eggleston, Director of Public Works for Palo Alto. Uh, our usual housekeeping items for this meeting, we are recording the meeting and we will post it on the website for the city. Uh, we'll also send out a link following the meeting and we're streaming it live on YouTube uh, right now. Uh, you can ask questions or make comments in the Zoom Q&A function during the meeting. Uh, our, we have a staff team uh, staffing that function, and we'll try to answer questions during the meeting if we can, but questions we don't get to will also be tracked and answered later. Uh, and I do also want to point out that Council Member Tom Dubois is joining the ad hoc committee this year as our uh, third member of the committee. So next slide on the agenda. This is our agenda for today's meeting. We're going to have a quick recap of the January ad hoc meeting that focused on wildfire impacts and sea level rise. Uh, then we'll get into funding and financing of the SCAP. Uh, we'll have presentations from two outside experts on financing for energy upgrades, followed by an overview from Palo Alto utility staff of the work that's been done to date on funding the SCAP. We will take a break after the first two presentations, but we'll plan to save questions and comments from the committee members and our working group, uh, and then public comment after uh, we finish all three of the presentations. So I will now turn it over to Sustainability Manager, Christine Wong. Thanks, Brad, and good morning, everyone. Um, so just a quick, quick recap of our January SCAP Ad Hoc Committee meeting. We had our best attendance uh, to date of all of our ad hoc meetings. We had 110 participants and an additional seven people who are watching on our YouTube live stream. Um, we had questions covering themes such as how Palo Alto's urban forest is being considered with relation to wildfire protection programs, the relationship between wildfire protection and building electrification, um, sources of sea level rise, and flood zones and FEMA flood zone designations. We also had suggestions and comments uh, covering air filtration, especially in our older homes, the social cost of carbon, and building electrification. Um, and as Brad said, the recording of that uh, meeting is on YouTube on the sustainability uh, channel at the City of Palo Alto's YouTube playlist. So um, we highly encourage you to watch that if you haven't. It was a wonderful session. Um, today's session, uh, we are going to be discussing funding and financing and a very brief introduction to the concept um, and focusing on uh, asking questions such as what approaches can we take um, to finance individual electrification processes or projects, uh, what funding sources are available for our three-year work plan, um, what ideas we should be exploring for funding a community scale sustainability and climate action plan effort. And even though uh, today's focus will be on residential and non-residential building electrification, we, do, we will touch upon all SCAP climate change areas um, around energy, specifically in buildings, electric vehicles, and mobility. And as Brad mentioned, we are joined by two industry experts today, and uh, we'll conclude with one staff presentation. Um, and just as, as, as a reminder, as Brad mentioned, we will be answering questions uh, that you add to the Q&A box as best as we can. Um, but just a note that uh, the presenters obviously will not be able to answer your questions while they're presenting. So please be patient. Uh, uh, they will answer your questions as soon as they can. And if for any reason there are un unanswered questions at the end of today's session, we will answer them after the session and post all of those answers on our website. So we are fortunate today to be joined by Dr. Holmes Hummel and Miriam Jaffe-Block. 
Uh, first, Dr. Hummel will discuss inclusive financial solutions for customer energy upgrades. Um, clean Energy Works was founded by Dr. Holmes Hummel to accelerate investments in the clean energy economy on inclusive terms that are fiscally sustainable and financially scalable. Since then, Clean Energy Works has won recognition as a winner of or finalist in five international searches for high-impact innovation and breakthrough solutions for clean energy deployment. Previously, Dr. Hummel served as the Senior Policy Advisor in the Department of Energy's Office of Policy and International Affairs from 2009 to 2013. Among the responsibilities in that role, Dr. Hummel convened the first agency-wide working group on finance with a focus on expanding participation in the clean energy economy. In addition to prior work with energy innovators in the Silicon Valley, Dr. Hummel earned a doctorate degree from Stanford University for interdisciplinary research on energy technology scenarios that achieve 100% clean energy for all. Currently an adjunct professor at Stanford, Dr. Hummel collaborates with Dr. Anthony Kinslow II to teach a course called Quest for an Inclusive Clean Energy Economy. After Dr. Hummel, we will hear from Miriam Jaffe Block, who will discuss Go Green Financing, a state run private capital financing program. Miriam Jaffe Block is a senior manager at the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority, where she oversees the Go Green Financing suite of energy efficiency programs. Under her leadership, the programs are expanding to offer decarbonization options to more customers, financing at the point of sale for online efficient appliance purchases, and an on-bill repayment feature. Previously, Miriam worked for Beneficial State Bank and Foundation on an expedited underwriting process for small business lending and secured over $3.8 million in CDFI fund grant awards to the bank. Prior to that, she spent a decade in the labor movement, including as a director of internal organizing at a hotel workers union. She holds a BA in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania and an MBA from Georgetown. Now I'll turn the presentation over uh, to Dr. Hummel. Thank you so much, Christine, for the generous introduction, the invitation to be here and your leadership for the city in the pursuit of its sustainability objectives in a way that is most notable for the level of stakeholder engagement and citizen action that the city of Palo Alto not only sustains, but welcomes, encourages and creates in my experience, um, a great bright spot for the convergence of civic action and climate action. I have some prepared visual aids because pictures are worth thousands of words. And I want to make sure, Christine, that we're coordinated because I can share screen using Zoom or I know that you have some controls there. Which would you prefer? Um, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, super. Let's see? We sh should be sharing here. And you may see a cover page with uh, an aerial view of houses. Christine, are you able to see that? Thank you. Okay, great. Well, we're off and running then in what will be a short introduction to the field of thought around how leaders at every level of jurisdiction can meet the expectations of 100% fossil free future clean energy economies that still yet have a lot of fossil fuels distributed throughout in our residential sector in particular. The most familiar financial solutions that we have for driving fossil fuels out of the landscapes of where people live, work and play have historically not been inclusive. They have systematically disqualified people based on income or credit score or their renter status, which is a particular category of interest in the city of Palo Alto. The sources of capital also have historically not been fiscally sustainable. They've come in big lumpy sums that start and stop, and they've been very difficult to scale. Even when we do have working programs, 
we haven't been able to see them grow to the level of uptake and participation that would imply that we are keeping pace with the targets we aim for. I mentioned moments ago that we know for a fact that the data is important to face. We have relied for decades, 50 years in fact, on a set of energy assistance programs for which there has not been increasing political capital to move financial capital. So on the left-hand side, we've uh, underfunded or left many unmet needs on building energy upgrades that would otherwise be affordable and desirable. And on the right-hand side, we know that the traditional coverage of the loan products offered by a financial services sector and also any of the financial products that require credit-worthy counterparties, including leases or loans that are uh, offered through property assessed clean energy programs have limited coverage. The gap in the middle is one that can be calculated. And for some states or cities, it's a smaller hole than others. But in every place, there is a gap. And the gap is a source of tension in concerns about whether or not it will be possible to achieve 100% clean energy economy goals. The comments on the left and the right here underscore observations I was making moments ago. So I want to move to the uh, most common responses to this challenge. First, that in places where we presume that building owners will just want to go into debt to pay for building energy upgrades, we have to face the data that many do not. And that even when offered debt on favorable terms, they may not actually move forward. So we have turned to government policies that are designed to set up special financial programs to make debt that's specifically for building energy upgrades even more attractive than the best loans that would be available for any other purpose. And here in the bottom of the screen, you'll see some ongoing experiments in how we can induce the opportunity to go into debt to improve building energy performance uh, in the building sector that has parts of the building sector that haven't been reached yet and make it more popular, even populist, so that more people will opt into those programs and make use of the capital. The last 10 years, uh, have seen those experiments on the prior page emerge, some with backing from the Recovery Act, which was the last major federal investment in trying to improve the performance of the building stock. And here, what I want to underscore is that for the programs that have made data available to the national labs, the longitudinal study that was published in the past year shows that none of the programs offered in any state in any year had been able to reach 0.1% of the households that the state actually hoped to reach with its state-backed loan programs. And in the same study, the National Labs found that 90% of the people that had been reached had credit qualifications that mean that the federal, the financial services sector very likely could have met their needs for credit. Now, yes, the financial services sector would not have delivered subsidized credit to these characters, but they may not have needed subsidized credit in order to move forward with the upgrades to their buildings. This is what leads me to contribute to today's civic dialogue about the innovation of inclusive utility investment, which is outside of the financial services sector and free from the underwriting criteria that systematically exclude people from using the debt-based products that are marketed from the financial services sector and have shown a degree of uptake that's higher than what we've been documenting in the financial services sector over the last decade. Where is inclusive utility investment happening? This map shows in the green dots where there are active programs offered by utilities that assure that anyone in their service area can capitalize all cost-effective upgrades without having to take on a financial obligation like a debt burden. And in the states that are shaded the darkest blue, there's already been a, a state policy action taken with statewide precedent that clears the path for more utilities and more communities to do the same. And in the light blue, 
especially you can note here, of course, California, there are state proceedings that are underway diligencing systems like pay as you save, which has been to date the most common way of implementing an inclusive utility investment program. I should note that the green dot here, because of the audience being in Palo Alto, is not Palo Alto directly. It is actually the water utilities that are part of the Bay Ren system uh, served through ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments, and the city of Windsor, Hayward, and uh, East Bay Mud, I think, are involved in those programs right now. Let me say a word about how inclusive utility investment works. Now that you know that there are some people who have been road testing it in places that can give confidence that the city of Palo Alto's attention here is not misplaced. But how was it, how could it work? First, utilities deliver all of their services to customers under agreements that are called tariffs. And in the innovation that we're discussing here, the utilities tariff allows for site specific investment with cost recovery that is also site specific. And that is the innovation. Whereas the city of Palo Alto and all utilities typically make investments in a supply system that is shared by all customers, spreading the customers, spreading the cost across all ratepayers. Tariffs for site specific investment and cost recovery allow the utility to capitalize upgrades to specific buildings on fair terms. And also, just like their ability to deliver electricity services to any customer, regardless of their credit score or whether they're a renter or what their income may be, they can do the same with site specific investments like building energy efficiency and electrification. One of the constraints on inclusive utility investment, however, is the performance of the upgrades, which is to say it is never okay for the utility to make a money losing investment and then obligate a customer to undertake cost recovery for something that worsened their financial position. So that means that the utilities investments do need to be cost effective from the start. From a consumer's perspective, a majority of the people who have been offered the opportunity to participate after having their home or building assessed for their savings opportunity have chosen to accept the opportunity. And it's because of this simple set of sentences that all of you can see on the screen. Imagine yourself experiencing the city of Palo Alto being able to offer upgrades that save money installed in your building without you paying anything upfront. The utility pays for that installation and it's not a charity program. The utility will recover its cost for the charge added to your bill that's less than the estimated savings. This is not a transaction that involves a debt obligation, hits to your credit check, uh, credit score. There's no lien as there would be in the senior lien position of a property assessed clean energy program and no ongoing debt if you move away from this location. When the utility recovers its cost, its cost recovery is over, so the charge ends. And the charge also ends if the upgrade fails and is not repaired or if you move away because it's not tied to you. These upgrades are actually associated with the site served by the utility. For those of you who are joining today's conversation because of your interest in finance and financial transactions, these next two diagrams are designed to help you see how the money can flow to and through the community as each and every building becomes fossil free. First, the utility is able to tap the same lines of capital that it uses for all of its investments. And utilities, no matter whether they're municipal or for-profit utilities, have excellent options for sourcing large amounts of low-cost capital. The utility then partners with local solution providers that are part of our competitive landscape of innovators and entrepreneurs who produce their solutions and estimate the costs for the upgrades and the saving streams that would result for the locations that are individually assessed. Once installed, the on-bill cost recovery charge facilitates the utility's ability to meet its obligations to its capital providers. And customers may come and go from the upgraded locations in the utility service area, knowing that they are in buildings that are benefiting from those upgrades, that their bills are lower than they would have been otherwise for the same level of energy services. There are <clears throat> many people who recognize 
that the precedent of on-bill financing as a concept has been with us for decades. I want to distinguish between on-bill loans and a site-specific utility investment in building energy upgrades by showing you the attributes on the left that afford more consumer protection and less resistance to accepting the offer than we've observed with the debt-based programs. In the following slide, you'll see an example that comes from, well, a utility in Kentucky that has had experience over the last decade offering inclusive utility investments. And while this example uses $10,000 for upgrades, this was a house that had a lot of room for improvement. Most of the upgrades in the field recorded by utilities across the country are closer to $7,500 than 10,000. But with the round numbers here, you can see that the customer is enjoying net savings from the beginning. And that's also why when new customers move into that location, they're automatically better off. And they're also automatically assigned the cost recovery for the utility because it's fair. Fair for them to participate in the utilities cost recovery that allows the utility to continue to make an offer to everyone in its service area. For loans, which typically are qualified with underwriting criteria that <clears throat> allows fewer than half of the households to pass through those filters, an inclusive utility investment program can literally serve every location in the utility service area. And while on the loan programs have had conversion rates of one in 10, and California's Go Green financing program, which you'll hear about next from Miriam, has had an even higher level of uptake for those people who've been able to pursue the program. What we've seen with the conversion rates across the country is that every single utility that's made an inclusive utility investment offer has reported that a majority of their customers who receive that offer say yes. And the most recent programs are consistently reporting 80 to 90% acceptance rates, which is stratospheric. And the last pair of bar charts that you see by, comparison, by comparing debt products to utility investments is that when the utility can invest over the full period of cost recovery you expect for the useful life of these upgrades, they are able to take the whole building and do whole building retrofits. They are able to get deeper savings and offer bigger upgrades than an individual customer might be willing to undertake when they think to themselves, gee, I, I just don't know if I'm gonna be here at this location for that long, or I don't think I need to prioritize every building energy upgrade uh, while I'm here. And then in the last column, the bar chart shows that the risk exposure overall for the utilities cost recovery is extraordinarily low. And every utility with experience has reported 99.9% .9 cost recovery or better. I'll close with just a few points of reference for the <clears throat> participants in today's conversation that want to learn more or research more with the resources available online. Here you see a snapshot from the Department of Energy's program for the Better Buildings Solution Center. Their issue brief on tariff on bill investment, which is the jargon term for using inclusive utility investments carried through a utility tariff can easily be found by typing in issue brief for tariff on bill. And also the EPA this past week launched a resource center on inclusive utility investment that provides even more in-depth information. I've previously had the privilege to meet with the city of Palo Alto officials who sought resources like this one, a utility guide to tariff on bill that can give residents of the city of Palo Alto a preview into how a utility might be able to bring a solution like this to their service area. And specific to California, the Building Decarbonization Coalition led a six month stakeholder process for more than a hundred stakeholders that produced a longer report called Towards an Accessible Financing Solution that delves into how all Californians may need to consider the benefits of inclusive utility investment in order for the state to meet its carbon goals. Uh, that are obviously in a foreseeable future. With that, I would like to return the attention back to our hosts and facilitators, anticipating that there'll be time for exchange and deliberation at a later point in the program.
There we go. I think I've stopped sharing screen. Christine, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Hummel. Um, now uh, we have Marianne Joffe Block. Um, if you would like to share your screen, and if not, I can uh, share for you. Thank you. Good morning. Let me see if I am able to. Actually, I think I need to start. Well, let's see here. Okay, what do you see? Do you see the notes page or do you see the slides? I see your slides. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, thank you so much, Christine. Um, thank you to the mayor and the council members and um, to the utility uh, staff for inviting me here today. Uh, thank you also for your forward thinking and exploring and pursuing financing to reach your uh, ambitious uh, decarbonization and energy reduction goals. Um, and thank you for all your reach codes and everything you've been doing to um, further the um, further uh, progress towards uh, greenhouse gas reduction. I um, really appreciate being here in esteemed company and thank you Holmes for all of the innovative thought um, and really important uh, points that you always bring to these conversations and all of the work that um, Clean Energy Works is doing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, California Hub for Energy Efficiency Financing, which was created to leverage private capital for energy efic efficiency investment. So I'm gonna talk about one of the loan programs that Holmes just contextualized with some of the challenges behind it. Um, and I'm gonna explain some of the thinking as well. So as you know, there's simply not enough subsidy capital to pay for the investment needed to upgrade all of the buildings in Palo Alto or all of the buildings in California to get the energy savings that we need. And so our programs exist to support behind the meter um, investments, customer investments in existing buildings. So the chief is currently operating three programs that are part of the Go Green uh, financing suite of programs. So Go Green Home is for renters or homeowners to make upgrades to their homes. The use of a credit enhancement, which I'll speak a little bit more about later, makes the financing options through the program accessible and affordable. And customers have access to rates up to, or as low as 2.95% and rates out to 15 years. The Go Green Business Program is for business owners, whether owners or renters of their space, to make upgrades. And this program has provisions for an on-bill repayment feature soon to launch. So I know we've just talked about on-bill finance and tariffed on-bill finance. On-bill repayment is usually used to describe third-party private capital repaid through the utility bill. So it's still a debt product repaid through the utility bill. We also have a program for um, multi uh, owners of affordable multifamily units. So this next slide helps make sense of all of the different acronyms and organizations involved. I work for a state agency called CAFA, the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority, and we are housed in the state treasurer's office. Uh, because we're a public rulemaking agency and accustomed to managing the types of credit enhancement vehicles used to leverage private capital, we were asked by the California Public Utilities Commission, who regulates the investor-owned utilities, to administer the chief. And Go Green Financing, which is the term I'll keep using, that is a, the name of the programs and the public facing platform. So this, the Public Utility Commission, as the regulator of the investor owned utilities in the state, has been tasked with deriving energy savings from the utilities portfolios. And knowing that there's not enough ratepayer dollars or public funds to get to the investment we need, the commission authorized funding to pilot financing programs back in 2013, which CAPA is now administering. And some of the original thinking of the Public Utilities Commission with that decision was to test if financing alone could achieve the types of energy savings on par with traditional rebate or incentive programs. And a credit enhancement would be used as the vehicle to leverage private capital. And I'll note that we as program administrators, we think of a credit enhancement very differently from an incentive or a rebate as um, a credit enhancement can be revolved as long as customers repay their loans, um, the credit enhancement can be redeployed to support new loans. And one more kind of uh, facet of the Public Utility Commission's thinking was that 
this would be a program where customers would have a choice of just selecting their lender as opposed to some other state programs that might choose a single company to originate uh, loans for residential customers and for business customers. Here's a brief timeline. Uh, Go Green Home launched as a pilot in 2016. And in 2020, the commission approved that program to transition from pilot to a full program. What's most significant for this group today was that in August of 2021, the commission uh, continued the chief programs for the next five years. They authorized a decision um, authorizing another five years of the programs. And for the first time, they gave Cape a permission to expand the programs to non-IOU customers, provided we could find alternative funding outside of the IOU public purpose program funds that have been uh, we've been using so far. So CADVA had been advocating for a long time that having different rules for eligibility for this program um, was frustrating across different utility jurisdictions was frustrating contractors and lenders who crisscross utility jurisdictions all day long and don't really focus on whether it's a municipal or investor owned utility providing the service. So this expansion authorization is really good news. As I mentioned, our main tool to leverage private capital is this credit enhancement. And this is kind of what um, Holmes was describing is um, using some sort of um, a pool of capital like a credit enhancement to make the financing more attractive. So lenders are able to, um, they receive a credit enhancement contribution on every loan they enroll in the program and then they can recoup up to 90% of the value of a charge off. We see this being very effective to change the terms of the financing. With Go Green Home, we've seen four main benefits to customers. The first is lower rates. The credit enhancement allows lenders to lower their rates at times over a thousand basis points. We have a lender right now offering financing for 60 months at 3.49% for credit scores as low as 580, which just would not happen you know, if that customer were to walk straight into the credit union without the credit enhancement. Um, second, most unsecured products on the market are limited to five years but the credit enhancement allows lenders to extend their terms up to 15 years, which is important in keeping monthly payments low for big ticket items like heat pumps. Um, the third benefit we see is lenders extend the maximum amount of capital that customers can access. And finally, most lenders have, have lowered their minimum credit score acceptance to either 580 or uh, 600. So we'll talk for a minute about what can be financed through our programs. All of our programs have a list of pre-qualified energy efficiency measures, um, and that include financing is, is include, um, can cover legal and practical measures necessary for installation, like relocating a water heater to put in a heat pump water heater or upgrading an electrical panel. And we wanted to be a financing program that was relevant to the investor-owned utilities and REN and CCA programs that we work with. So anything that is part of um, an IOU, REN, or CCA energy efficiency program is also eligible to be financed. And because, as I've mentioned, we don't see financing as an incentive, we have taken a more flexible approach with what can be um, included. And so that includes two code projects because customers themselves are making the investment. There are many, many homes in California that were created prior to Title 24, that were constructed prior to Title 24. So we made that decision to allow for financing um, to code. One note that I wanna make here is that because this, the funding for this program thus far has come from the energy efficiency budgets through the ratepayer dollars that the Public Utility Commission um, oversees, we cannot at this time- Miriam, you're breaking up a bit. Oh no. There we go. Okay. I'm in the office. I thought I would have better, better internet. How is that? Yeah, it was coming through uh, fine on my end there. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we are not allowed to provide the credit enhancement to lenders for solar or battery storage for distributed generation or storage right now. It's an energy efficiency and demand response program but I believe that will change um, soon. And that energy efficiency program includes heat pump technology as part of building electrification goals. 
So we see these programs as part of a suite of financing solutions that serve different customers. So along with traditional home equity loans, PACE programs, tariffed on bill inclusive financing that Holmes just presented, all of these are needed to help make custo help customers make their energy upgrades. And the niche market that Go Green Home is best suited for is borrowers who don't want to use their property as collateral uh, because they don't own it or they don't want to lean on it. And uh, credit challenged and LMI customers to the extent that these customers have the cash flow needed to repay a private capital loan. And uh, most significantly, perhaps customers who need the extended terms, who need to stretch out those monthly payments over a long period of time. And there's, it's similar with Go Green Business. Multiple options and strategies are needed to help get us to the energy savings that we need. All of the um, investor owned utilities run a 0% on bill financing program, a revolving loan fund. And our program complements the on-bill programs in many ways because um, those programs have um, pretty strict criteria often around what measures can be financed or payback um, requirements. And um, there are often investments that customers need and want to make in their homes and in their businesses that aren't going to be paid for completely out of energy savings. They're just capital improvements. Um, and so that's where a private financing program can step in. I'll share some uh, quick data from our programs. As of the end of 2021, Go Green Home had facilitated close to 29 million um, in private lending from nine participating finance companies. And the credit enhancement was leveraged such that um, we leveraged about $6.54 with every dollar of credit enhancement. So you can see here the average term length was 106 months. So a lot of customers are taking advantage of extended terms. And then the graphs at the right show the dollar impact on customers from the credit enhancement. So the top graph is customers who took out a 60 month loan saved on average over $2,000 in interest versus what they would have paid from that credit union um, without uh, the Go Green program from the same credit union's product. And then the bottom graph just shows the difference in monthly payments when um, with the monthly payment that the customer had with their extended term versus what they would have had to pay to repay the same loan in, in 60 months. And so that's where we see the projects really becoming doable when that monthly payment becomes reasonable. Uh, reaching small businesses is a goal of CAFA, the state and the Public Utility Commission, but this is a very challenging market to serve. Um, the credit enhancement produces similar financing benefits for small business owners, but small business owners have a whole suite of things to worry about um, with running their business, particularly in the time of the pandemic, and aren't necessarily spending time thinking about energy efficiency um, or are reluctant in this environment to take on debt, even at favorable terms. So we will often say, you know, financing doesn't create a demand for energy efficiency or decarbonization, it just removes a barrier. Um, however, we have leveraged about 1.7 million in private capital in the program, have established a network of contractors and finance companies. We're gonna be launching on bill. Um, and we believe the key to getting business owners to make these upgrades are robust partnerships with the programs, the utility programs and the green business programs where people are reaching these businesses on the ground through the phone. Um, and letting them know about opportunities where they really can save energy and money. So I wanna be clear that the Go Green financing programs are debt-based programs or private capital loans, as I think is a category that the city of Palo Alto is using to sort of think about these different product types. We want to make these loans as accessible as possible to underserved communities, but it's also pretty critical that we don't make loans to people who are not able to repay them. So it might be best to understand this program as a moderate income program. 56% uh, of loans have gone to customers in LMI census tracts, and the program provides lenders with a larger credit enhancement contribution for customers who have credit scores under 640 and who are LMI, but ultimately those customers need to have the cash flow to repay loans. Um, we do have some consumer protections, I should mention. Our regulations require borrowers to have a minimum credit score of 580 and a max debt to income ratio of 55%. Most importantly, lenders have skin in the game on every loan. They will take a loss on every loan that defaults and that helps align interests where they are also making 
um, loans that can be repaid. So our Go Green Home Lenders report approving about 50% of applicants. That means we're able to serve about half the need or half the demand through the program. There are a lot of individuals who want to make energy upgrades, but who need another solution, such as you know, what we've seen with tariff on bill financing, inclusive financing. And we see the private capital loans again as an important part of the solution. You know, one thing to note is that there are energy investments that customers need to make right now for the state to reach its decarbonization goals that aren't necessarily going to be repaid through energy savings on the energy bill alone, particularly the heat pump technology is challenging in that respect. I think Palo Alto might be a little bit unique in that you are providing both gas and electric service. So you set prices for both. So I, I think your economics might be slightly different than what we see elsewhere in the state. Um, but to the extent that the heat pump technology needs to be subsidized to make it accessible for a cost recovery on the bill, you know, our recommendation is dedicate your subsidy to income qualified customers and then make affordable financing available for customers who can take on the debt to maximize impact. So where are we going from here? Uh, most significantly, uh, perhaps, um, we've been concerned for years about this web of complexity where we could do heat pumps in West Sacramento, but not Sacramento because of the funding silos and the utility, public utility commission rules. And so under our new authority to bring in funding outside of the public purpose program funds, we've just started a partnership with the Tech Initiative, which is a statewide initiative for decarbonization. And so starting in April, all IOU gas customers, even those who have public utility service for electricity will be able to do heat pumps, uh, heat pump water heaters and space heating through our program. Um, we're really, really excited about this. And this is our first sort of larger launch um, to be more consistent statewide. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for Palo Alto because you're not an IOU gas provider, you have your own gas service, but it does set us up um, for this type of expansion. Um, we have other plans to help us scale. We are recruiting some specialty lenders like Knife, the National Energy Improvement Fund or Investment Fund, about joining Go Green Home. Uh, gives contractors a different business model to work with that some of them prefer. We're making IT investments to help our credit unions um, have faster processes and um, get sort of very quick um, assistance from program staff about eligibility and communicate with contractors. One thing we're considering in the next few years is trying to increase that private capital leverage ratio. We think our contribution to lenders right now might be a little overly generous. Um, the average contribution is about 15% of loan value, but defaults rates are less than 2%. If we could shift that contribution down to 10%, we'd leverage $10 of private capital for every $1 credit enhancement. And then also we are very eager to be able to credit enhance comprehensive decarbonization projects that include on-site generation, storage, EV charging, heat pump technology all together. And so we will be asking the Public Utility Commission for the ability to sort of go ahead to leverage what we built with these programs and um, either use appropriate ratepayer funding or outside sources of funds to expand. So this brings us to the opportunity for the city of Palo Alto you know, as you think about your goals of the 80% energy reduction by 2035 and building electrification, one part of your suite of solutions could be joining the CHEAP and participating in the Go Green financing programs. At this moment in time, we are authorized to expand the programs to POU customers as long as we don't use IOU ratepayer funds. So you could join an existing state program and leverage the infrastructure built your customers would get a choice of loan and financing products. We have two statewide lenders right now who serve Santa Clara County. My guess is we will have at least one or two more in the next uh, few months. Um, we, there's also opportunities to recruit local credit unions or local banks uh, together. Um, and providing, or so one critical consideration is that participating in Go Green financing would require um, covering administrative costs in addition to some of the administrative costs in addition to the credit enhancement. To give you some numbers there, you know, a million dollars if Palo Alto were to make an investment in credit enhancement, that would leverage at current rates, 
6.5 million in private capital or about 400 loans at our average of 16,500 each. Um, and like I said, we're trying to get that leverage ratio up over the next few years. So, um, and then I guess the last um, note is just providing access to a loan program allows you to channel the subsidy dollars to the income qualified customers and encourage customers who can take on the debt to do so. And if the commission were to grant us approval to expand our financing to comprehensive measures, which I am expecting, um, I am optimistic, maybe that's a better word than expecting, because um, of course I can't speak for the commission. Um, then Palo Alto could decide if you wanted to use your dollars to credit enhance other technologies beyond energy efficiency. I really appreciate being part of this discussion today and commend your staff on the research and analysis they're doing in terms of helping the city think through next steps. Um, I provided some links, they'll be on the, the slides that are available afterwards to various reports of ours, as well as our regulations, which can all be found on the state treasurer's webpage. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Holmes and Miriam, uh, very informative. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone, we're going to take a break. I think we'll break now, it's 9.48 and come back at 9.55. Uh, we'll have one more presentation and then questions and comments from the ad hoc and working group. Uh, and at the end, after those questions and comments, we'll take public comment. Okay, so let's take a break. See you back shortly.
Okay, I think it's time to bring us back from break. Uh, so now I want to introduce Jonathan Abenshine, Assistant Director of Utilities uh, for the Resource Planning Group, and Shiva Swami Nathan, who is a Senior Resource Planner. And they will give the uh, staff presentation on funding and financing of the SCAP. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jonathan Abenshine, and uh, uh, I also, uh, again, the Assistant Director of Utilities for uh, Resource Management, and uh, we have Shiva Swaminathan from my team. I'll be presenting today, but uh, Shiva is really our expert. Uh, he's unfortunately had to be out a little bit over the last week while we were develop, uh, developing and finalizing these slides. So while I'll be presenting, uh, this is really Shiva's work, and uh, he will be available for, for the Q&A. Um, since he, he is our team's expert on this. Uh, let's see, let me make sure I'm on the right slide here. First off, uh, I do want to say thanks to Dr. Hummel and Ms. Joffe Block for their presentations earlier. Um, I and my team have learned quite a bit uh, about financing from them and others that we've talked to over the last several months. So, um, our presentation is really intended, they are the experts. Uh, our presentation today is really intended to give you a sense of um, the city staff's current understanding of project financing and, and how we think it fits into the context of funding both the 2022 through 2024 work plan and the entire SCAP. Uh, our understanding really is in the early stages, and there's a lot to discuss, but we hope this presentation helps set the stage for some detailed conversations uh, that we'll be having with our working group in the future. Now, first off, I, I want to remind people a little bit about the context for this conversation. So first off, we did an estimate uh, uh, last April about the community cost to electrify. Um, again, it was very preliminary and we're, we're continuing to evaluate and digging into assumptions, but it did turn out to be, at least our first look turned out to be pretty encouraging. The community's cost, net of community savings was equivalent to about uh, 10 to 20 million per year, uh, which is about five to 10% of the total amount the community spends on energy each year. The community spends about 200 to 250 million on electricity and gas annually. Um, but that's really heavily dependent on financing. When we brought the impact analysis last year, we were estimating about 750 million in upfront capital investment needed, which, you know, again, I'll say again, we acknowledged and, you know, still acknowledge that that's a, that's a conservatively high estimate. That'll probably come down a bit due to technological changes and other factors. Um, but we estimated that with financing, that leads to an, those, the repayment of those capital costs leads to about an annual cost to the community of those SCAP efforts of about 50, 50 million to 60 million per year. And then that this would be offset by significant savings, about 40 million per year. Um, and the major insight for us was how important financing was. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars is really a difficult level of capital investment, but when you when you figure out how to finance it over a long period, it becomes something uh, much more manageable for the community, something that the community could absorb. Um, in addition, over the you know we we have this long long term full scale implementation of the SCAP that we need to do, uh, but we also have a near term work plan, 2022 through 2024 that's really focused on getting some of these programs off the ground. And uh, again, financing is important. We estimate preliminarily that the cost of this um, work plan is in the ballpark of 56 million, uh, although we have identified around 35 million in funding that we'll talk about here soon. Um, and obviously the costs here change depending on what part of the work plan we prioritize and the approach we choose. We'll be talking about this in upcoming working group meetings. But project financing can make a difference in really making the most of these funding sources that we have. Now, to understand why project financing can be critical to both the 2022 through 2024 work plan and to the SCAP as a whole, it's really worth thinking about a simple example about how financing really maximizes a fixed revenue stream. If, for example, you have about a million dollars per year in revenue, available to spend on incentives uh, or you know helping with let's say building electrification and let's say you need about ten thousand dollars in investment per home for the types of projects you're thinking about uh, you could uh, finance 
but let's say the entire upfront cost of those projects, or sorry, you could fund the entire upfront cost of those projects, uh, $10,000, that would give you about 100 projects per year that you could fund. And over 10 years, you'd get about 1,000 projects done with that million dollar revenue stream. On the other hand, if you were to obtain uh, financing for that $10,000 and use your million dollar per year revenue stream for repayment assistance, you could um, fund all thousand of those homes in the first couple of years and uh, use that million dollar per year um, revenue stream to provide repayment assistant, assistance over the next 10 years. Uh, so it really allows you to accelerate things and make the best use of, um, of uh, the funding streams that you have. So I would say it's important to just keep that in mind through this entire presentation. Uh, before we jump into project financing, though, I, I want to start off with just a little discussion of the 2022 through 2024 work plan and potential funding sources. Um, I don't really want to get into how that $56 million we're estimating for the um, 2022 through 2024 work plan breaks down today, since it is preliminary and, and we're going to be doing some work with the working group prioritizing that. So that number will change. Uh, but I did want to give you an overview of the types of funding sources that are available. Uh, last October, we estimated a, we have about $35 million in funding available, and that breaks down according to the table shown here. Uh, this includes money that is currently being held in reserves and also forecasts of new revenues. But we're expecting we have about $16 million in electric and gas revenue related to the state's cap and trade program, uh, about $10 million in revenues related to our participation in the state's low carbon fuel standard fund program, and about 6 million related to uh, public benefits spending, which is a, a utility um, funding source that has traditionally been related to energy efficiency, but is, is opening up to more types of projects uh, in the last few years. And we also have a couple of million in transportation grants as well. I'm not gonna go into every funding source and its limitations, but I'm really happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, I've also listed some other funding sources we're talking about exploring, including electric or gas ratepayer funding. You know, there are new revenues and capital savings that could justify some level of ratepayer funding. Uh, setting up a new voluntary Palo Alto Green program and also other types of philanthropy as well. And of course, we're really looking for ideas from the community as well. Um, and, and so we'll be talking about that more uh, again with the working group in the coming months. Um, but really looking forward to people's feedback. <clears throat> but again, project financing is important and the same principle applies when we talk about funding the full SCAP. We, we thought, again, we're in the very early stages of thinking about full funding the full SCAP, but we've thought through a couple of approaches here. Again, we could either try to provide a lot of funding and incentives up front, or we could tap into private financing. And, and provide repayment assistance. And of course, we could design these programs differently depending on what part of the community we're talking about. Uh, low income programs we might design differently, for example. If we wanted to provide a lot of funding and incentives up front, it would probably mean issuing bonds of some kind. And if we do that, we would need a revenue stream like a carbon tax or a parcel tax or something similar to repay the bonds. On the other hand, if we wanted to provide repayment assistance, we could offer other uh, financing programs and then use the tax revenue stream to provide repayment assistance. Both approaches actually end up, for the, for the full SCAP, both approaches can be kind of similar in terms of the cash flows provided, but they may involve different levels of risk for the city. Both of them involve pretty novel uses of municipal taxing and bonding authority, and they do, are gonna require some legal research. And um, some of those legal issues may end up defining whether it makes more sense to seek project financing or uh, deal with a, a, a bonding approach. So those are the two ideas we've considered exploring for funding the full SCAP. We are really interested in others because this is a very, um, a topic that's really ripe for exploration here. Okay. So let's talk about project financing. Um, project financing, while it is, I think, gonna be critical, both in the near term and the long term, uh, it isn't something that has to apply to every part of the climate action plan. 
Um, we don't need innovative finance for all aspects of the SCAP. Those who wanna buy an EV are pretty adequately served by traditional auto financing. Um, mobility measures can be funded through traditional muni bonds, uh, you know, to build bike lanes and things like that. Um, there is definitely a discussion we probably need to have about mobility priorities generally and what funding sources might be available to repay bonds if that were an, an, an avenue that we wanted to go down. Utility improvements likewise can be funded through traditional utility bond issuances. And here I'll just stop for a moment and note that the, 700, that the capital investment number I, I noted earlier did not include the cost of upgrading the electric system or retiring gas lines. Um, we did a study back in 2020 that estimated uh, between 40 million and 100 million just for single family areas back in 2020. Um, that was a very preliminary estimate. We need to do a more detailed engineering study. Um, but for context, again, you know, uh, when, you, when you start talking about financing, uh, um, $100 million in bond financing is really only equivalent to about a one time. 3% to 5% rate increase to repay the bonds. So financing makes a really big difference in how those, uh, how those impacts end up uh, being felt to the community. So coming back to project financing, again, not every element of the SCAP needs innovation, but it could help in the area of building electrification and EV charging. So while traditional financing exists um, for uh, electrification and EV charging projects, Innovation in financing could help lower interest rates. It could provide access to borrowers who have trouble uh, accessing traditional credit avenues. Um, it could enable off balance sheet financing of improvements that might make businesses more willing to take action. And the ability to transfer the loan with the property could be attractive uh, to folks who are hesitant about investing if they're unsure about their, their, their long-term living situation. Uh, and then there are also financing models that could enable um, landlords and tenants to partner in, in building improvements, um, eliminating those landlord tenant split incentives where the landlord has to make an investment but may not be able to recover costs from tenants. Tenants may want to pay the cost of invest, an investment but don't have the ability to make the investment. So there's an opportunity to partner with these financing programs. And then lastly, project execution can be streamlined if financing is packaged with, with a sustainability program like a direct install program. So here's an overview of some of the different financing models we encountered in our research. And again, um, we're, we're not trying to settle necessarily on a single program. Uh, you know, we could have multiple programs uh, and, I, and I will also defer to um, experts here. You know, we have, we have a couple of experts with us today. And so if there's anything I'm saying about these programs that maybe needs a little bit of nuance added, I am, um, uh, really glad that we have other folks, um, you know, who can speak to that as well. Uh, so the first financing model we've we've looked at is property assessed clean energy or PACE, and that involves taking out an energy related loan against the building owner's property. Uh, the debt is repaid through property taxes, uh, and it requires with coordination with other lenders uh, like mortgage lenders to ensure the loans are properly prioritized for repayment. We have one PACE provider working in Palo Alto. Uh, and this, so it's available now, and, and this type of loan does not require municipal involvement uh, beyond approving the PACE providers, but it could be promoted in, in tandem with our other programs. The next models are on-bill repayment and on-bill financing, which you've heard a bit about today, and that involves either a private capital provider or a utility making a loan to the customer and being repaid uh, via the utility bill. On-bill financing, uh, as I understand, typically has slightly lower interest rates um, because the utility instead of a private capital provider is making the loan, but interest rates are generally lower because the payment is being collected via the utility bill, uh, regardless of the program. Issues that have to be addressed around these types of programs include whose capital is at risk in the default, how to pay off and retire the loan when a property changes hands, uh, and whether utility service is disconnected in the event of non-payment. That's a really important question. Tariff on bill financing takes these programs a step further with the utility providing capital and actually owning the equipment with, with the customer paying an ongoing charge for a period of time. The charge is tariffed, which for regulated utilities is like a rate schedule. In Palo Alto, we wouldn't call it tariff on bill. My attorneys keep regularly 
reminding me that uh, we use rate schedules, we don't use tariffs, so we'd have to call it something different. Uh, and this means that the ongoing charge though, for the whatever you call it, it means the ongoing charge for the equipment remains with the meter, not the utility customer. And so uh, it can be transferred with the property or the customer. It can allow renters to participate in paying for improvements. Uh, it can reduce the landlord split incentive issue, but it is critical in this type of program that the ongoing charge the customer pays does not exceed the utility bill savings, uh, as you've heard earlier. And that makes it useful for energy and water efficiency, but also it, it creates challenges for building electrification because those can involve an increase in utility bills. And so you have to work out things like incentives to deal with that issue. And, and that's something we're exploring right now. Uh, and then there are also other pu public private financing models that don't involve a utility bill at all. Uh, and they don't encumber the property. Again, Go Green is a great example of this. You've heard a lot about that earlier. Um, where the agencies or utilities are providing a loan loss reserve, uh, but are not necessarily otherwise involved, although Go Green is considering adding an on-bill repayment feature as well. So, um, Let's see here. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my slides. Good. OK, now this slide summarizes the trade-offs between the different financing mechanisms that I just mentioned in the previous slide, and again, as staff best understands so far. All of the programs we listed here provide interest rates that are either comparable or lower than traditional alternatives. So we're comparing personal to personal loans, which range from 6% to well above 10% per year, or home equity loans, which are in the four and a half to 6% range right now. Um, PACE programs are a bit of an exception. We, we understand interest rates can be in the 5% to 9% range. And given the PACE encumbers the property, we're expecting a home equity loan would normally be a, a better alternative for a single family homeowner. The PACE does have some other advantages that can make it useful in the commercial sector. Uh, you know, being able to pass costs through the tenants, um, uh, enabling the loan to transfer with the property and keeping the cost of these upgrades off the owner's books. But there have been definitely some reputational challenges with PACE. Um, I think LA may have ended some of their PACE programs uh, earlier. Um, there have been issues around uh, contractors selling people on loans that they can't actually afford um, and, and challenges and, and impacts to the property as well. So um, it is something that we really have to look into uh, to make sure we're, we're addressing those issues if we wanted to use it. Uh, on-bill repayment and on-bill financing programs typically have lower interest rates as do public-private partnerships to finance energy improvements. But they don't, again, have all of the other beneficial features of tariffed on bill financing or PACE financing. Um, and these programs are also usually based on customers' credit scores. And so, in, and so that means two things. First off, some borrowers may not be able to participate. And in other cases, uh, home equity loans may end up providing more favorable interest rates in these programs, depending on the building owner's credit score. Uh, tariffed on bill avoids the issue of checking credit scores, as you heard earlier, since the repayment charge can transfer with the property, and it also has a number of other helpful features like I discussed earlier. But again, the challenge is that you need that net savings on the, on the, uh, on the, the bill. Okay, so this slide and the next couple will just summarize some existing programs we found in the Bay Area. Like we mentioned before, we already have a PACE provider already available in Palo Alto, and, and we will soon be eligible to join Go, the Go Green financing program. We're already eligible to join the Water Upgrade Safe program. Other programs are offered by other providers and really are just provided as examples of other programs provided in the region. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Uh, the same for this extremely busy slide. Um, this is really meant as background once we share out the slides. Uh, if people want to do a little of their own research and dig into some of these other programs and understand what's on offer, out in the rest of the, um, the region. Uh, here are some links that people can use to do their own research. Again, not gonna dwell on these. And so that brings me to um, the end of the presentation and, and really the questions and areas for exploration that, that we have, that, that we're, we're looking at right now. I know that this, these presentations are a lot of information to absorb, and so I know to absorb, and so I know you won't be at all surprised that there's a lot of, um, there's still a lot of outstanding questions that we need to work through. 
I would say with respect to project financing, you know, the questions are which program or programs do we want to offer and promote? What sources of capital do we want to rely on? Uh, which loan programs are going to provide the most value and which uh, groups within the community will see the most value from those programs? And how do we ensure the lowest interest rates that we can? Uh, with respect to near-term and long-term SCAP implementation, what are the priority areas that we want to fund? What funding approaches should we be using? How does project financing fit into our plans? And uh, yeah, so these are all questions. These are all the questions that we're we're really eager to begin working through internally, and with the ad hoc subcommittee and the working groups, and, and really looking for for public participation and uh, and contributions in these areas. So that's it for my presentation. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A session. Okay, well, thank you, Jonathan. And so we have got through our presentation and, and reached the uh, time to have some feedback. And I'm gonna first uh, provide an opportunity for the uh, council members on the ad hoc uh, to give comments or ask questions. Mayor Burt? Yeah, well, first, I, I want to really thank uh, the two uh, outside presenters, uh, Dr. Holmes and, and uh, Ms. Jaffe Block. Those were really interesting, uh, very informative, and, uh, and yet, uh, for those of us who are just really diving into um, the different alternatives. Uh, uh, initially, we're, we're kind of drinking from a fire hose here and, and uh, looking forward to absorbing them and having follow-up questions as we really start to understand them better. But I think for a lot of us, um, both those presentations and, um, and what was presented by Jonathan and developed by uh, 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 Jonathan and, and Shiva, are um, really interesting and um, and I, I think at least for me, um, uh, provide a lot of optimism on that there are ways in which we might be able to to really uh, finance and fund the the outcomes that we're looking for and to do so uh, cost effectively and with equity. Um, I'm just uh, I'm really enthused about what we've heard today. Um, and I and I do want to uh, thank uh, Jonathan and Shiva for identifying and bringing to us um, our guest presenters. Um, that was just really valuable. So um, uh, that's my initial comments. I've got a lot more to absorb going forward, uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll withhold a lot of kind of future technical questions. Um, but uh, thanks again. This was really informative. Okay, Council Member Cormack. Thank you so much, uh, Director Eggleston. Um, and um, I do want to just ask a, a few questions um, around this, just to you know be sure, um, I, you know, I understand things. So uh, let me start with Dr. Hummel's presentation and recognizing that it's not a tariff, but it should be considered a, a rate schedule. Thank you, um, Mr. Abenshine, for uh, putting that out. I mean, fundamentally. Uh, sounds kind of too good to be true. So, so uh, maybe the question is for staff, what are, what are the initial hiccups we have um, preventing us from, from going with a, a structure like PACE? I mean, I'm guessing based on what I'm trying to look in there that we've got an issue where anything that isn't considered cost-effective can't be covered, but can you just give us a brief overview of you know, why, why we're not headed, headed down this path? Immediately. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll actually ask Shiva to join me too to fill in any um, any gaps in what I say here. But I think um, we're we're actually we actually have been trying to work through the different um, technical and and practical and and legal issues associated with on bill financing, tariffed on bill financing. And we don't think we think some of the barriers that we were concerned about a few years back we may have uh, overcome. Um, I think the big challenge really is, is about that, um, well, two things. First off, is, it's achieving that savings um, for the household. And so part of that's going to depend on 
a little bit on what sorts of programs we want to deliver going forward, um, because the the way to achieve those savings may differ depending on whether we're talking about low income programs, single family programs, multifamily programs, uh, small business programs, um, and finding the revenue sources to to make that to make that work. Um, I think we also have some open questions, and Shiva can probably uh, fill that in a little bit about fill in a little bit about whether um, there might be other approaches that might end up being uh, lower cost ultimately, and that's something that we really need to explore because there is this additional cost associated with evaluating the project and making sure that it does provide a cost savings. It doesn't it isn't as much there in other sorts of programs, and so I looked at both Dr. Hummel and. Uh, and, and, and uh, Shiva to, um, to flesh that out a little bit more. Yeah, if I may add to, add to that. So yes, the electrification programs uh, in Palo Alto will, will, is likely not to be able to produce net savings. So that'll preclude uh, many electrification projects. And the other part also is the utility has to take on ownership until the repayment happens. So is that an obligation we want to take on? It's another part of things. And then also the each project has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. So the administrative and evaluation costs tend to be higher. And it's primarily designed for um, inclusive financing so that be even folks who can't um, get traditional financing can access this type of uh, TOB type of program. So for our Palo Alto demographic and our Palo Alto programs, it's probably not best suited, but if there is a segment for low and mid middle income customers, that, that might be a model we may want to consider. This is where we may have, it, it may make sense to have multiple programs. It might not work for, it might not be the one that, that works for the majority of the community, but there might be a really important segment that we need to take care of um, to make sure that we're being inclusion, inclusionary and equitable and bringing everybody along on this transformation. It's really important. Dr. Hummel, did you have something you'd like to add to this conversation? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, drawing out the insights gained from the closing slides by the city's uh, experts. And again, like Miriam, I commend the leadership of the city in developing better awareness about all of these options. Uh, I do want to underscore that the observation of field data that we have from other places is that households at every income level respond with a higher acceptance rate when they're not actually asked to take on a debt obligation that administratively impedes their ability to do anything else they might want that is a higher financial priority for their family, whether it's saving for college, buying another vehicle, doing something else that they want to do. And so for a city that has a public policy of wanting to be fossil free, doing the door-to-door -door canvassing to persuade every single resident that they should want to go into debt in order to help the city achieve its goals does face some headwinds. And that's why making available an option that is debt free while still fully solvent can help the city accelerate deployment of technologies that are consistent with its, its goals. The um, administrative costs that Shiva mentioned in his closing remarks just now are often recovered through the program. So I do want to draw some clarity or distinction here between program administrative costs that are paid and never recovered, and the cost of assessing the opportunity for upgrading sites, which is typically always recovered by the utility and making its investment in those upgrades. Thank you again for the question. Yeah, thanks so much. And I feel like this is, we'll, we're probably going to need to put a pin in this particular topic and have more conversation at a later time, probably in the working group team. Um, what is incredibly appealing about this approach isn't just the financing part, it's the fact that it removes all these other barriers, right, that people have. And so that's what caught my attention. 
um, I think this is the kind of thing that's going to be required for us to cross the chasm, right? To move from people who have extra time, extra resources, extra interests to people who are like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do this. If I essentially check this box, it's going to happen. So thanks so much, um, Dr. Hummel for, for servicing that, um, really from sort of like the psychological, um, you know, standpoint, appreciate that. And then I have a quick question, um, for Ms. Jaffe Block. Um, I wonder if you could just walk us through, those of us who don't spend all day every day in, uh, in uh, public financing, a credit enhancement. So, I mean, are, we, are, are you literally giving money to the lenders? How are you adjusting? It's, walk us through the loan loss reserve, if you wouldn't mind, just a little bit of a, an overview, just so we understand this mechanism better. Sure, it's a great question. Um, so the credit enhancements, can come in many forms. The format that we have chosen to operate with our program is that we set up a loan loss reserve account for each lender at a trustee bank. So the CAPA has contracted with a bank that operates as the trustee. And so um, we have a program account of credit enhancement money for the Go Green Home program that's sort of sitting um, in a you know um, money market account um, but it's kind of waiting. And then as lenders enroll the loans and we make sure they, um, that they check the boxes for program requirements, we will make a contribution from that program account into their loss reserve account. If the borrower is not LMI or not credit challenged, it's 11% of what we call the claim eligible loan principal, which is basically, I, I think I went over that a little bit in the slide, but you can think of it most of the time as the loan principal. Um, so if it's $10,000 project, they get $1,100. If it's a um, credit challenge borrower or, low, or LMI borrower, then it's 20%. So it's $2,000 just gets moved in the trustee bank from one ledger into another. Lenders have access to see that account. And so their balance grows the more loans they enroll. So they are incentivized to do volume with the program um, in the event that they have a charge off. Um, they can file a claim with the program and we ask them, we require them to go through all their normal um, processes of what they would do with a charge off um, and how they would do their normal collections or recoveries. And then they would, they submit a claim to the program and provided that money is in their account, they can be paid up to 90% of that loss. So if the charge off, let's say they charge off um, $5,000 of that $10,000 loan, we will pay them from their loss reserve account $4,500. Then their loss reserve account is a little bit lower, but they've recouped the money on that loss. Um, and as I mentioned, they've got skin in the game for 10%. Annually, we will also go and rebalance the account. So we will look at all the paid off loans for the year and all loans that have paid off, we will recoup that original credit enhancement from them so that we can redeploy it to other lenders for new loans. Okay, super helpful. So the 15% then that you mentioned as uh, for the loan value is actually the average of the 11 and the 20. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate you, you walking us through yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, just my final comment is for this staff, so appreciative of slide 17. Um, you know, as we, as we all engage in this, um, you know, complicated area. Thank you for taking the time to really delineate all of these options that exist uh, and walk us through. This is really great um, foundational work for us to make some decisions going forward. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Du Bois. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, definitely very interesting today. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, you know, I think there, you know, we talk about home ownership, we talk about multifamily apartment housing. I think there's the third category that we should maybe look at a little bit more, which are HOAs and condo associations as a structure. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these have monthly fee fees that cover some sometimes utilities like gas. They have reserves, and a lot of these um, places in Palo Alto are aging and they have kind of much needed maintenance, and so I think it could be very attractive for them to leverage their reserves to do some of these upgrades and um, it just seems like a, a kind of a slightly different category where you're not going to ind individual homeowners 
but you go to the home homeowners association and potentially get a swath of, of you know, homes at once. And, you know, they have the ability to do special assessments and things. So um, I'm not sure how much of our housing inventory falls in that category, but it just seems like it could be a slightly different approach from the financing and the return on investment. Um, and then the other thing um, I just wanted to throw out there, and um, I did join late, so if I missed some uh, apologies, but really like comparing and looking at what other publicly owned utilities are doing across the whole state. Uh, you know, the final presentation looked at a lot of Bay Area programs, but it seems like this this doesn't necessarily have to be limited to the Bay Area. And, you know, I'd be really interested in what um, publicly owned utilities are doing elsewhere, what kind of programs they're offering. And um, maybe a slightly different take too, what if their utilities are exper experimenting with different billing models. And one thing I've been interested in is a budget-based uh, model for water, which I know some of the San Diego utilities are doing, um, which is just kind of a fundamental, fundamentally different approach to how we think about billing for utilities. So those are just a few thoughts, and um, thanks. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Du Bois. Uh, we're now going to turn to our working group members. So if members of the working group would like to ask questions or have comments, please raise your hand. And I see Debbie Mitels has her hand up. Good morning, and thank you for these wonderful presentations. Very informative, very helpful. Appreciate both of our uh, exterior experts, as well as the slides done by the city staff. Really appreciate it. Um, I had a question, I guess it's directed to um, Ms. Ms. Joffe Block. Want a little bit of clarification um, about the issue of the um, pay as you go program. Um, as I understood from what you said, as of 2021, the uh, CHEF program um, would be available to Palo Alto Utility customers for energy upgrades that do not involve um, gas related retrofits. Um, but that other energy efficiency changes could be included, maybe electric chargers or something like that. Um, is that correct? If, if we adopt a program like that, we, we could participate, but still not with gas? Um, let me try to clarify. So, and just pay as you save is the tariffed on bill model that Dr. Um, Holmes Hummel was presenting on. So the Go Green programs, um, we have authorization from the Public Utility Commission to expand to non-IOU customers, whether that's gas or electric. Um, so that that's sort of there. Um, the announcement that I was making was that we've we've secured our first source of funding outside of the IOU, you know, and, and PUC world, and we're um, we're partnering with the Tech Initiative, which does use. Um, it's, it is some sort of cap and trade derived funds. Um, so we are now um, spending those to expand to IOU gas customers who are served by public um, electricity providers. So the SMUDs and the LADWPs in the, of the world that you know are matched with PG&E and SoCal Gas. Um, so we're starting that expansion because Palo Alto is unique in that you um, provide your residents with both um, we don't have a funding source. So if Palo Alto wanted to participate, um, the city would have to make a decision to use some source of funding to pay into the program. Um, but we could do gas measures, electric measures, whatever your goals were. Um, you know, you could adopt our regulations as sort of they exist. And we've also, or we've made some changes to our regulations that allow different funders to set the criteria of what they would want their funds to be used with the credit enhancement. Um, the one thing that's pending is that um, we're in the process of asking the Public Utility Commission to allow us to use outside funding sources to credit enhance on-site generation, battery storage, EV charging infrastructure, and they have not said yes yet. I'm optimistic that they will because it's a similar ask to our geographic expansion. And if, and if 
other entities want to provide the funds, I think they will be amenable. Um, but we have to go through that formal sort of permission step that I'm expecting to take place um, sometime over the course of this year. Okay, that's really helpful. So the Go Green program is technically available to us, even for our gas enhancements, but there isn't any funding for it, like there is funding for the IOUs uh, through the tech program. And I understand we're not eligible for the tech program funding. And then you're pointing out that we the page the Go Green program is not yet available with funding and approval for um, EV chargers and storage and uh, distributed generation solar kinds of things. Right. Although my guess is if Palo Alto decided that the city wanted to participate, that that could probably be included around on the same on a similar timeline as on the energy efficiency side. I, I will say that while there isn't funding to support the credit enhancements and the kind of per loan transactional cost, you would be kind of um, leveraging infrastructure that the IOU ratepayers did build over the years. And that was actually a big debate within the Public Utility Commission proceedings is should the you know, POUs have to pay for the ratepayers to recoup the cost of their investment. And it was decided I think wisely that no, that this was an investment that already exists and that other entities can leverage it. So a lot of the work that has gone into it is, is sort of there and able to be capitalized upon. Right. Well, thank you so much. It's really helpful to have all these sort of smaller details figured out so we know what we can try to get. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. I'd like to call on Lincoln. So I have, I have a, um, uh, a business model question um, that I'd, I'd, I'd love to understand a little bit better. I'm looking at, at the, the times that we live in. So very, very low cost of capital. I mean, kind of eye-wateringly low cost of capital right now, maybe not for very long, but right now. And because we are bringing a whole lot more renewables into the system and those renewables have come down in price significantly, um, we're seeing in a lot of places electric rates that are basically steady with inflation as opposed to increasing in real terms. I'm curious about <clears throat> these business models and how, how flexible they are to a circumstance that I can see happening where the cost of money goes up perhaps substantially, but the savings associated with the efficiency improvements go down in dollar terms because uh, retail electric rates are either flat or, or going down in real terms. And so I, I wonder, is this it, it does, it, it seems like a, a wonderful thing. And that kind of triggers my inner New, inner New York finance guy, you know, uh, skepticism. And so I'm, I'm just curious, is this something that, that we can do now, but we couldn't do if, if interest rates were 10% and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, electric rates I either stayed flat or came down. I mean, is this, are we in kind of a unicorn time to make this happen? Um, so I, I'm, I would really love to hear from Dr. Hummel and, and uh, Ms. Jaffe Block on, on, the, on the sort of broader uh, scope of your question, but just a few notes about some elements unique to Palo Alto. Um, you're right that electricity rates are um, staying fairly flat, increasing I mean, with most recent inflation, maybe even below inflation, actually. Um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, very long-term contracts that we have uh, in our, in our um, system. The converse of that is that gas rates are, because of a variety of needed system investments, and this is outside Palo Alto, um, but also in Palo Alto are, in, are increasing in real terms. And so when we talk about electric energy efficiency, which has sort of been, I think, one of the major topics in, in these financing programs, yes, the savings on the bill are decreasing because of those flat electric rates. But in Palo Alto, because we're talking about 
building electrification or switching away from gasoline, where costs are increasing relative to these flat electric rates, your savings are actually increasing over time. And so there may be increasing opportunity in the future as opposed to decreasing opportunity uh, for the types of things Palo Alto is looking to do. Uh, I, I did actually participate in the Q&A box on a theme sim similar to this one, and Lincoln, it may have even been your question directly, but you've really uh, inspired me with the way that you closed the inquiry here in the open session, which is, are we in a unicorn moment? And the answer is uh, absolutely yes. Uh, we only have a very few number of years to rid fossil fuels from the landscape of the city of Palo Alto, and that is the most exquisite and narrow window of opportunity that we have. I would say that from a financial perspective, thinking about the dials and knobs on inflation and cost recovery, one thing that is important for us to observe is that the consumer protections built into the pay-as-you-save system highly favor the consumer, which is to say that if you have an electric efficiency upgrade and then electric rates rise, the value of your energy savings actually increase above what they were expected to be without that rate increase. Also, no matter how interest rates move in our economy, the systematic advantage of the utility's ability to source low cost capital beats the consumer finance products by hundreds of basis points. So no matter what the consumer finance market is offering consumers to finance their upgrades, the utilities cost of capital will almost inevitably and always be lower. That means that the city is in a position to advantage all consumers, regardless of their income, credit score, or renter status, against what their other options would be if they were left to fend for themselves to fulfill the city's climate policy objectives. I hope that's a helpful and responsive answer, and I pledge to the city to be available after today's discussion for further exploration of these and other topics. No, I, I and I asked the question because I I really like the I really like the structure. Um, and but you know when you when you like you like something so much you start you want to start looking under the hood and uh, you know seeing seeing what the you know uh, where the weaknesses might be. I just I, I hear you on the unicorn moment and I think I wonder and I, I and I, I've I've lived in the in the municipal world in terms of cost of capital. It's 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 a different world, but I'm just thinking of of you know the basic Fed funds rate going up and you know raising all boats. Municipal rates not as much as consumer rates, but still creating some stress on the business model, perhaps. Um, so that's a it's just a very wonky question, but I want to understand if we're if we're looking at something that we can do come hell or high water or whether we're, we really have to jump on this now given current fundamentals um, because it may be less uh, easy to do um, under different fundamentals. Let me try a second reply here quickly to point out that the upgrade of the building stock for energy efficiency and electrification is presumed to be a multi-decadal quest without relief in any foreseeable future. I fully expect the rest of my career to be characterized by an insistent demand for answers on how to capitalize upgrades where there are occupants that aren't offering up their own personal savings account to fulfill public policy objectives that actually, if missed, harm everyone. As a result, we are not in a unicorn moment for that perspective. In fact, we just have to get started on anything we think will work and be able to find ways to fiscally sustain and scale that effort. I think that um, we know that if the city of Palo Alto chooses to move forward in the direction of diligence towards any of the options that have been discussed today, a level of financial analysis would then be a next step. And the inquiries that you've raised in public forum here could easily be incorporated into the financial diligence that the city undertakes. Yeah, I agree, thank you. Diane Bailey. 
Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to comment. And uh, I want to lift up the comments that Debbie and Lincoln made. I, I think they were excellent and these presentations have been exceptional, so I don't have a lot to add. But just to say, um, yes, we are in a moment of great urgency with climate. And so I hope that we can act very quickly. I know that there's a lot of data to crunch through and information, and these can be really tough decisions. But um, you know, in contrast, every new fossil fuel device that gets installed today is a big mistake that needs to be undone. And so I think we do need to act with urgency and deliberately and, and work towards getting a program up and running quickly to support people. Um, and now we have a new label for that, the unicorn moment. Um, and, and that, you know, the unicorn moment, not just recognizing the climate crisis, but that the cost of capital is really cheap right now. And so that presents a wonderful opportunity to act. Um, I wanted to address the question of um, the electrification retrofit sometimes being a little more costly for people and costly initially with capital investment and then also with uh, utility bills over time. That is so problematic. And the statement that Dr. Hummel made earlier about um, people across all income spectrums not really being amenable to taking on additional debt and even you know, altruistic people who want to address the climate crisis, not really wanting to pay additional money to do that. I, I think that's true. That's a reality that we need to deal with. And so any step that the city and the utility can take to ensure that the costs are lower after electrification, um, I think would be extremely important. And there are a couple of different ways to do that. One is combining efficiency strategies with electrification in any program. And I think that's already being worked on, but just sort of making that an essential step that anytime electrification is being financed or supported through the city, that efficiency measures are taken in concert. Um, and the other, I think some commenters have raised is the lack of rebates and financial assistance for um, HVAC switching from gas to electric. Um, outside of Palo Alto, there are significant rebates. It would be a great idea for the city of Palo Alto and the utility to match the new tech rebate. That's $3,000 for heat pump HVAC. It'd be a really good idea to try to match that and provide that little bit of assistance because HVAC in particular, I think is probably the most costly switch that people can make if they already have air conditioning with their gas furnace. It's a tough economic proposition for people right now. And then there are two other steps that the city, uh, I would really uh, recommend looking into to keep the costs under control so that a pays type program can work out. One of those is bulk purchasing to get the equipment costs of heat pumps down. And the other is direct insulation programs. And we've heard really excellent proposals uh, such as the Be Smart program that sort of uh, couple together direct installation programs with a tariff on bill financing and other strategies. So not to go into detail and retread that territory, just to say, I think the city does have opportunities to keep the costs low and that's really essential to the success of these programs. Thanks. Okay, I think we're ready now to turn to our uh, public comment session. So if you're an attendee and, and you would like to speak, please raise your hand. And I think Karin North, our Assistant Director of Public Works is gonna take on uh, managing calling on you. So currently Hamilton Hutchins, you have your hand raised. So you're, oh, hold on. My screen just changed. Let me find you again. All right, you're allowed to talk Hamilton. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Palo Alto staff has recently said it was essentially impossible to achieve 100% home electrification by 2030 without a very large capital investment because they did not have the infrastructure to deliver that amount of electricity over the existing grid. Microgrids also provide resilience against power outages and eliminate inefficiencies of transporting electricity. Let's not forget the city has a single point of failure for our electrical grid location, which is difficult and expensive to fix. Almost all of the 100% renewable power the city can, almost all of the 100% renewable power, okay. 
hopefully we can stop. Almost all of the 100% renewable power the city consumes comes from outside the city, from fixed resources like dams and wind farms, where the city must compete on the open market. For the power the city obtains, it means another city will not get it and need to use fossil fuels to fill the gap. That is because there is a fixed limited amount of 100% renewable energy. Because rooftop solar increases the total amount of 100% renewable energy supply and reduces the total amount of fossil fuels burned and reduces electrical grid infrastructure and is more resilient, rooftop solar is very beneficial and should be maximized. The city should continue to pay market rate costs for electricity for solar panel owners who contribute their excess electricity to the city's grid. The city should pay for HVAC switching like other cities do, as the panel host mentioned. The pay as you serve, save program sounds like a great idea that the city should adopt, which is a program between the city and the property owner. However, for the go green home loans, the lower the rate, the more successful the program. Covering comprehensive clean energy projects would be a big win. The city should find incentives for homeowners who self-finance, such as through a home equity loan, in order to increase the total supply of solar. For rooftop solar to thrive, it should not just be cost neutral, but cash flow positive for the property owner making the decision, and the city's incentive should support this. Thank you. Is anyone else we're going to raise their hand? John Kelly, you're going to be allowed to talk. I thank you very much for the presentations today. I, I guess I want to focus on something which is maybe a philosophical issue. And that is that the today's discussion is really focused on, on funding and financing, and it has not uh, covered things concerning taxes. And I think it's really uh, important for the city to examine taxes in the context of the SCAP program, both because the council's already signaled an intention to put at least one and perhaps multiple taxes on the ballot uh, this fall. And if we take seriously the notion that we are trying to go carbon neutral, we should perhaps ask whether we could use the, the taxing opportunity that we have at the ballot box to really focus more on our climate goals rather than uh, other goals that the city has. So that's, that's kind of the philosophical issue. But the economic point is that taxes can serve a dual purpose. They can not only provide the funding uh, that's necessary to pay for some of the costs associated with uh, vehicle electrification and, and residential electrification, but they also send a, an enormously strong price signal which can change behavior much more quickly than simply providing uh, funding mechanisms can. So I guess I've got two particular questions, uh, one of which has already been offered by the staff, but I, I would like to raise it anyway. The first is, I think it's very important that the city consider a progressive municipal carbon tax, particularly one that's largely um, revenue neutral. And I don't expect uh, the members of the committee to respond to that proposal, which I understand has now been sent to you today. But I think it belongs on the city's agenda and if it's not appropriate to discuss today, then I hope that it would come back at a, a later point in the SCAP deliberations. And the second thing is, if I recall correctly from the analysis that was presented by the staff uh, last spring, uh, the lion's share of the uh, you know, greenhouse gas pollution uh, reductions that we're seeking in Palo Alto really have to do with uh, transportation. And so I understand from, uh, from Christine Long that congestion pricing is prohibited by the state of California. I'll accept that. But I think that that's first of all, something that we should try to change legislatively. And second, even if it is prohibited as Christine uh, Long also mentioned, if the city's exploring congestion pricing for parking, I think that should be part of this discussion too, particularly a form of congestion pricing for parking which is variable and dynamic as, as I've proposed to the city council before. The variability would come in the, in the sense that citizens of Palo Alto or uh, people who are shopping at uh, Palo Alto retail establishments might, play, might pay a, a lower base price and it would also be dynamic 
in the sense that the charges for parking uh, would vary at different times of day. So I, I would encourage the SCAP committee to consider those types of taxes in particular uh, as complements to the, uh, the types of things that Dr. Hummel and, um, excuse me, I'm gonna get your name wrong. Oh yeah, Ms. Jaffe Block have outlined earlier today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I'm not seeing any more hands raised. If you want to okay. comment, please raise your hand or we can just move on, Brad. Yeah, let's give it a couple more seconds, but it looks like those may be our only uh, speakers from the public today. Okay, I don't see any more hands. So um, I'd like to turn it back to the uh, ad hoc members for any uh, closing thoughts or, or more questions if you have them. I'm, I'm going to be fine with uh, reserving mine for follow-ups. I, I think we're, this is the beginning of a deeper discussion with our upcoming uh, working group teams, which are, for those who aren't familiar, we, we um, uh, are structuring this so that we'll be having uh, teams on technologies, funding, community scaling, and, communi and communications. And that's where we really think a lot of the rubber meeting the road is going to happen on, on um our, our, our outputs from this uh, effort uh, of the, of the um, SCAP uh, ad hoc committee and recommendations to the city council. Um, so uh, if others aren't uh, needing to wait in at this time, I know we, we have an, a final item of uh, looking at our upcoming meeting schedule. Uh, just before we lose them, I, I wanna again, thank the OIC oh, uh, and council member uh, Cormac has something, but I want to again uh, thank uh, our, our guest speakers and the great staff uh, work that's been done here uh, and the uh, the 90 participants who are in this meeting today. Um, just one quick follow up and then one thing that I wanted to uh, emphasize. So the question was about um, and, and, and it's it's hard to monitor all the questions um, in the chat. So, and I know this is recorded, but um, just be helpful after this if staff can figure out some way to send that to us. Um, Cause I think there were a lot of interesting things in there. Um, but the one is um, rebates for heat pumps. So uh, we've had a comment that other jurisdictions have rebates for heat pumps and we don't. Can, can staff just address that? So we'd be sure we get all the information out. Um, so that is true. It's um, something that's in our work plan. We have incentives right now for <clears throat> heat pump water heaters, but in terms of the incentives to roll out, and we have in our work plan to roll out other incentives. Um, but, you know, again, we're, we're still in the process of having these conversations with the working group about the work plan, and um, we don't have those incentives rolled out yet. How long would it take to roll out that incentive? It would be a matter of uh, giving attention to that. Um, it would not take that long, um, but I think we're I think we're we're waiting for some resolution on um, what direction we're trying to trying to go with the work plan in some in some in some elements of the work plan right now. Okay, well let's let's not wait too long on that then. <laughs> um, and then I just um, I, I I don't know if I copied it down exactly, but I just want um, to end my remarks with the quote that Dr. Hummel had: "We just have to get started on anything that we think will work." That's pretty close to what she said, and and that really resonated for me. I know we have such a tension between um, our usual practice in Palo Alto of extensive research um, and, um, and the urgency of the situation. So I think we might have to be a little bit more comfortable with trying something um, sooner rather than later and then um, adjusting as we go. It's actually not unlike what we've had to do through the pandemic in terms of the response to the virus itself and our finances. So. I know it's a little uncomfortable for everybody, um, but uh, I think it's warranted in this instance. Thanks.
Okay, and as the mayor referenced, here's our slide on upcoming meetings. Uh, Christine, you want to walk us through? Sure thing. So our next uh, scheduled meeting is on March 10th. Uh, that one will be slightly different than what we've been doing in the past. Um, as we mentioned previously, we now have a SCAP ad hoc working group. Um, and the working group is breaking into four different teams uh, to do a deeper dive in various aspects of um, our SCAP uh, proposal. So what we hope to do in March is to have the working group teams uh, present on their work plans and uh, the items that they're working on. And then in April, on April 14th, um, that is the last currently scheduled meeting that we have, um, although we may schedule more. Um, we'll be focusing on carbon reduction and capture. Um, so looking at carbon neutrality, uh, low carbon construction materials, and uh, starting the discussion of what do we do after 80 by 30? What is our climate goal after that? Um, and we hope to be joined by some Stanford students who are working on a carbon neutrality research project for us at the moment. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for this conversation and for your attendance today. Uh, again, very interesting and hope to see all of you uh, next week for the discussion with our, uh, our teams. Thanks, and with that, we're going to close out the meeting.